Lewis Popper. I'm one of uh, that uh, I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, you are all here, if you came to the right place, to, to follow what's happening with the sale of the Clark School, the campus, almost all of the campus, all but one building of the campus of the Clark School for Hearing and Speech. And uh, you probably know, and, and we'll talk a little bit more that, about the fact that the campus is being sold. That is probably the reason you are here. And we'll tell you what we know about it. Uh, the, the group is a group of six of us who have been call us the leadership group, or uh, we actually call ourselves the core group because we couldn't think of a better name. If you think of a better name, you can write in. Um, and our core group consists of, I'll just go in order, Eddie Rose, Dick Green, Janet Gross, Sarah Metcalf, and uh, Robert Jonas must be some, oh, Robert Jonas. Uh, and we have invited, really, any, this is open to the public, we've invited everyone we, whose email address or other address we could find. And we're glad you're here. There's nothing secret about this at all. In fact, Wayne Fyden, who's the director of the city's planning and development department, uh, said quite correctly, I should note that this is not a city meeting. It's not a public meeting because if it were, it would be subject to the open meeting laws. And we are not. Therefore, we can close this and make it all a secret. But, in fact, we're doing the opposite. Uh, if you're wondering who the young woman is that is looking into some sort of device, uh, what is it, cat skin? Uh, her name is Emily, and she is with the North Street Neighborhood Association, yep. which puts this meeting, will put this meeting, on their website. And one of the reasons they are considerately oh, this doing is this fun. is that they know some people could not be here because they're at the mayoral debate tonight. Uh, and I think that's very, I'm glad you're doing that, and uh, you should know, and we all should know, that therefore we can see what happened uh, on, on, the, on a website. Um, okay, I'm not going to do more, much more than introduce. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet. Let me pass around a sign-up sheet on each side of the aisle, so to speak. Uh, well, why don't we start, well... Start with the well, audience, so but we'll those who don't have seats, please take them there. Yeah. Yes, please, please sit down. Come on up there, two right in the front row here. <laughs> what, if, what if we like standing? Uh, that, that's that's let me permitted. consult with the <laughs> board group, but I think it'll be all right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we there's a what's called an Elm Street Historic District Commission, which is the one existing historic district in Northampton. Uh, we are in touch with them, and they have been represented in our deliberations to a degree. Uh, they could not, they had no one they could send tonight, so nobody's here from there, but I just wanted to tell you that, that they're not. We are fortunate to have, we invited, to the extent we could find them, uh, incumbents in elective office, and also candidates for elective office, and we are fortunate enough to have here uh, I believe it's three, and anybody I miss, please say so. Two candidates for councilman, or council, not man, council at large, council persons at large, and one is Jesse Adams, who we're glad to have here, and the other is Mike Janik, who is back there. Uh, we also have Ward 2, as you know, has a race, and Ward 2 is the ward in which the Clark School is. And we are fortunate enough to have here Jackie Misa, who please uh, uh, identify yourself. Good, and, and she's here. Um, anything else I should tell you? We've invited uh, the representatives of media, whom we know who are interested in this. And I have not, if you are from the media, other than Emily, of course, please put up your hand. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you or meet you on the way in. Okay, we do not have somebody from media here, although they are in touch with us, and in fact, uh, they will be covering some stories. We'll have radio reports and so forth. Um, I think 
that this, you probably all got an agenda, the, a little small pile of agendas is on the back of the bench there. There are a few left, Emily, aren't there? Yeah. If any of you don't have one and <laughs> wish to have one, you can either walk back or somebody friendly might bring you one. Uh, I was just going to mention that uh, Bill Corwin, President of Park, is invited to Ah, yes. As we said, we wanted this to be open to get all points of view. The, uh, our object is to make sure that all interests in the community are represented in the, media, in the, the, the talks, the discussions, the decisions, and we certainly did it by Clark. And if they are somebody here that we don't recognize, please say so. But if uh, we can hope maybe some Oh, please, excuse me. I'm too late to I live here in Northampton, and I'm a trustee. Oh, okay, good. You're welcome. Okay. Great. Um, good. Well, then we do have some. Are you representing Clark or? I'm the and, and Okay. Well, that's good. We're not all if representing one interest only. You are a neighbor, and you are a Clark School trustee. Well, that's great. Um, our first, we will have two people speaking to you, and our first is Sarah Metcalf, who is, uh, as I said, one of our core group, and she will be talking uh, about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. She will talk uh, briefly and then open to questions. We were thinking it might be more orderly to hold questions till after she speaks, and then our subsequent speaker, whom Sarah will introduce. After that, there'll be an opportunity for questions too. Uh, I think that's it. Let's go. Thanks. It's great to see this many people in the room. I'm glad to know there are so many people interested in this subject. And uh, I don't want to mislead you. We don't have insider information on any plans for the development of the Clark campus. All we can tell you about is what we neighbors have been um, talking about uh, for our, our visions, our hopes, our concerns for the neighborhood at Round Hill and uh, abutters of Clark and other people who live, who live nearby. But we also um, think that um, probably the city as a whole will be, you know, people of the city as a whole will be interested in, in knowing um, in what way the campus comes to be developed in the future. Um, so, uh, when we first learned um, that the Clark School as a whole was going to be uh, offered up for sale with the exception of uh, really a single building and a relatively small portion of the campus, um, people in the neighborhood uh, obviously were concerned. We have a neighborhood listserv that enabled us to share some concerns with each other and, and uh, after a lot of sort of freeform back and forth on the subject, we um, agreed to have a neighborhood meeting, uh, which occurred at Robert Jonas's house um, in, at the end of May. Uh, and I think we had between 20 and 30 um, interested neighbors there. And because of space limitations, we had asked that no more than one person per household attend that meeting. So it's possible that it, it would have been uh, a, larger, a larger meeting, but for our kind of self-imposed restrictions. So at that meeting, uh, Wayne was present, Wayne Feiden, uh, who is here tonight and uh, is the director of, uh, I'm looking at your exact title, Planning and Development. Um, and uh, Marissa Lapizzetta was there as well. She's the chair of the Elm Street Historic District. Um, they both were very helpful in um, giving us information about what, uh, as a neighborhood, we might consider um, doing to, um, in order to give ourselves some voice in uh, what might happen in the development of the Clark campus. And we, we shared our concerns with each other very freely about um, our, our admiration for the beautiful and historic buildings that are on the Clark campus and on Round Hill Road, um, our, 
our appreciation for the beauty of the campus, its open spaces, its many mature trees, um, and, uh, and the general quality and character of our neighborhood, which of course we, we treasure. And um, so uh, after a lot of conversation about ways in which we might be able to um, uh, help to preserve some of the features of the neighborhood that we most value, um, we as a group decided that our best course of action would be to uh, pursue becoming a part of the Elm Street Historic District. Um, and I'm sorry that nobody uh, on the committee that oversees that district is here this evening, but I'll do my best to provide you with information about the implications of joining the Historic District. And I do have with me the uh, Elm, Street, Elm Street Historic District design standards and procedures and so forth. And I will read you a little bit of, of stuff out of this just to kind of acquaint you with um, the implications uh, of, of becoming part of the Historic District. Um, so once we had this group meeting and we had a kind of consensus in that room about what we wanted to do, this, this committee of people who has called your, this meeting tonight, uh, of which I'm one, uh, we just stuck forward. We were, we were not elected. We were self-selected. We were the people with, with time and energy and interest to devote to pursuing this. Um, and so uh, we began to educate ourselves about the, uh, both the implications of joining the historic district and also find out what the procedures are that you have to follow. And there's a fair amount of research and documentation and paperwork that, um, that has to happen. Uh, and we've been undertaking all of that. I, I thought first I'd, uh, I'd just quote a few documents to you. Um, this is from the Massachusetts Guidelines for Historic Districts. Uh, it says, uh, the strongest form of protection, this is for, for historic structures, um, is a local historic district created through a local bylaw or ordinance in a local historic district before any exterior architectural feature that is visible from a public way is altered. The plans to carry out that alteration must first be approved by a local historic district commission. Um, so it's, it's not that changes can't happen, but that there is a process to consider proposed changes and weigh them against the, um, the, the historic features that have been defined um, and, and consider how changes should be made or suggest amendments to those changes. Um, and uh, the benefits of local historic districts in brief are, and again I quote, to preserve and protect the distinctive characteristics of buildings and places significant in the history of the Commonwealth and its cities and towns, to maintain and improve the settings of those buildings and places, um, and to encourage new designs compatible with existing buildings in the district. Um, and unlike uh, just adding buildings to the National Register, which is a voluntary thing and which has no kind of enforcement capabilities, the, uh, the historic district is supported by Northampton ordinances, um, which, which gives it some, uh, some clout uh, for it of its standards. Um, so that, that's just a really, really brief um, explanation of what the historic uh, district function is. Um, there's an application process. If you, you know, if you have a building that's within the historic district, you want to make changes, you want to remodel, anything that pertains to a facade visible from a public way. There's an application process, a review process, and so forth. It's all it's all very well spelled out in this uh, in this manual. Um, and the uh, 
there's there's a, a description of design fundamentals that the historic uh, commission committee would be looking at. Um, the architectural value of the building, the significance of a site, the design of a building, its height and setback, um, its uh, harmony with surrounding buildings, uh, compatibility of new construction with existing buildings, and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it pertains to uh, additions to existing buildings, it pertains even to some extent, we believe, to landscaping um, and there are you know they're really quite explicit um, criteria that are spelled out in this in these guidelines and in, if you have the agenda you also have the website uh, from which you can get access to these complete guidelines download them print them out and I also have this copy here tonight which you're certainly free to come look at um, so our steps, we learned, were going to be um, to document uh, what the historic buildings are in the proposed extension for the, uh, for the Elm Street District, um, to survey affected neighbors and see whether or not they supported the idea of joining the historic district, given that it imposes certain restrictions on, on those of us who would fall within it. Um, and uh, so we did survey everyone affected. I don't know the exact numbers of, of the people that we asked, but the overwhelming majority of them, uh, I think with only one or two exceptions, all said that they were very strongly in favor of joining the historic district. And Janet uh, has all of that uh, information uh, documented in a part of a part of the report that she has now submitted. Um, we, uh, we met with Paul Spector, who is our Ward 2 City Councilor, to uh, ask him about what the process might be like for, for um, getting approval of the extension of the historic district. There, it comes to a vote before the City Council. And he was very helpful to us in kind of explaining how that would work and uh, anticipating the, the various steps. We um, invited Christopher Skelly of the Massachusetts Historical Commission to come take a look at the neighborhood with us. And Carrie Buckley of Historic Northampton walked up and down the <coughs> hill with us. And we learned an awful lot about the history of the neighborhood. And I, uh, Janet did a great deal of research on this for uh, the materials that she prepared substantiating our, our uh, bid to be made part of the historic district. And I, I have done some research on this as well. Um, and if anyone is kind of curious about this, I made some copies of, of early uh, drawings of, of Round Hill as it existed, you know, in 1810, in 1860. Um, some historic maps of the area showing on the top of the hill, uh, there, there were three notable mansions up there, uh, and they were used in succession by the Northampton School for Boys, uh, and then by a, a water cure establishment, which sort of morphed into a hotel and spa, and was at one point very grand. And in fact, Crescent <coughs> Street came into being as a, as a carriage road to lead to the stables below, below this hotel. I found this all very, very interesting. And um, some of the earliest buildings, uh, at least some portion of them are still standing on Round Hill Road. Uh, Rogers Hall is very, very old. And it is, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the first buildings ever built on the hill. Um, and there's another house very near it, which is uh, of similar vintage. Um, and then after, uh, after the, the hotel and, uh, and, these, and these earliest uh, institutions on Round Hill uh, faded away, uh, very early the Clark School in, in its first manifestation um, 
moved into the neighborhood and began to uh, acquire property and to build some of the buildings that um, remain on, on Round Hill. Um, I've got uh, a map from uh, 1895 showing the <coughs> campus and some very interesting shots of, of buildings that we know and walk past uh, frequently on, you know, the Dirt Hill, which was then Round Hill Road. Um, so there's really an awful lot of information substantiating our claim to historical significance. Uh, in the neighborhood, uh, and and it was really a pleasure uh, to learn about all of that, and uh, certainly reinforced our sense that that there's um, there's a, there are many historical traces in our neighborhood that um, that should be preserved. Um, we. Uh, Janet primarily uh, crafted the preliminary study report that, that our committee was working on. It also includes uh, these individual documents about each of the addresses that, that would be affected um, with quite extensive architectural notes and history on, on each of the structures. Um, and this was all presented to the Historic District Committee uh, just quite recently, and in a preliminary uh, way was approved. Uh, there are a few little amendments and changes that we need to make, but we expect um, that they will that they will endorse our work, and and uh, and then they take on the task of kind of finalizing uh, the, uh, the submission the submission of our of our documentation to the Massachusetts uh, Historical Commission for approval, at which point um, then the uh, matter comes back to Northampton. Um, we have to, the, the Elm Street Historic District Commission then would submit to City Council uh, a proposal that, that the Historic District be expanded to include Round Hill um, neighborhood, and uh, it's my understanding that two thirds vote is needed to approve to approve that, um, and uh, and then you know assuming that all goes according to plan, we will. Um, but there have to be there has to be uh, uh, at least one meeting that's a public hearing for people to weigh in on it. And I believe there's also a 60 day waiting <coughs> period of some kind. So. It's a, it's a process that has a number of, of steps that still have yet to be moved through, but, but we certainly hope and expect that we may be becoming part of the uh, historic district. Um, we don't yet know uh, how that may uh, play into uh, conversation between the developer of the Clark campus and neighbors of the Clark campus. Um, and it's possible that uh, our uh, joining of the historic district will make it possible for us to um, have an influence of some kind on on the nature of the development and its, uh, its aesthetics as far as we can view them from the road. Um, uh, it may also uh, make it possible for us to um, meet with uh, the developer and discuss our concerns, their interests, and so forth. We certainly hope at some point in the future to be able to have um, some two-way conversation about uh, elements of the neighborhood that, that we, we treasure and value and hope will not be um, negatively impacted by whatever it is, uh, is done with the campus in the future. Um, so at this point, if there's anything about this part of the work that we've done, uh, I certainly would welcome comments or questions. The second part of our of our uh, 
meeting tonight is going to focus on um, some work that uh, a group that Jonas has been part of has done. They, they presented to Clark when Clark was uh, receiving um, bids from developers. Uh, Jonas was part of a group that, that offered up a, a possible plan for the development of the campus, and he has materials pertaining to that. Uh, his group's plan was not the one selected by Clark. So it, it is not um, you know, anything that's, that's going to happen, but it's a sort of a sample of a possible plan that we thought it might be valuable to present this evening, um, both as a way of kind of focusing, focusing specifically on um, the, the campus itself, its, its layout, its existing buildings, its possible uses, what, what they conceivably could look like, um, and also uh, as a way of um, preparing all of us to be able to look at site plans and, and drawings of this kind in general and read them, understand them, consider what issues they raise so that in the future when the real developer has uh, actual plans to present for public comment, um, we would have had some experience looking at similar drawings and, uh, and we might have already considered some of the um, some of the issues that are raised by you know development on the campus and, and be kind of better prepared to talk about them. So if you um, you know if you have anything you want to ask or any comment you want to make now, Jennifer. Hi, hi. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you all for all the work you've done. Um, I'm Jennifer Addis. I live on Bancroft Road, and um, and I'm, as I'm hearing you describe um, the process that this historic joining the historic uh, district will, entails, I'm thinking about that point when it comes back. If it makes it that far, and I'm optimistic, I hope from what you're saying that it will make it that far, and it comes back to the city council to wonder we've got an election coming up. Um, how many people are actually on the city council and does it make sense for us to find out where they stand on this and for us to, those of us that support this, to use election time as a time to bring forth our concerns because, um, you know, Clark is an institution with a lot of influence in Northampton and while they contributed a lot, I really am very concerned about the development and how the development will be done. And I feel like this historic district is really uh, a critical piece to neighbors having any say. And so I wonder, I don't know about the city council and the numbers and the, you know, that issue. Well, we've had occasion to talk to certain city council members and uh, and candidates for the city council, and I think anybody in this room who is interested in this issue uh, should do the same thing. You know, if you have an opinion on the subject and you want your councilor to know, or if you want to ask a candidate um, where they stand on the issue, absolutely. That's I I think that's. That's a good way of proceeding. And we're, we're certainly very interested in knowing what people's um, views are on this, and uh, and we'd like to have a chance to talk to them too about uh, about concerns of, of people who, who live in the neighborhood. Though I think you know the development of the Clark campus is of concern to more people than just the people who are right cheek by jowl. With it. I think. Uh, you know, <coughs> The, uh, the quality of the neighborhood is, is and, and its historical uh, uh, buildings are, are of value for the city as a whole. Yes. Uh, Sarah, in, in uh, relation to Jennifer's question, has it been part of the charge of the core group to, other than Paul Spector, to be in touch with city council uh, members? We've done a bit of that, yeah, we have. Apparently, the uh, Elm Street group 
when they were at this point invited the the chair invited each city council member to her house for breakfast and I can assure you that we have been practicing making waffles and candy. <laughs> I think the point here is that the more voices that each city council person hears, uh, the more concerned city council people will be. I mean, Jesse, maybe you want to speak to that point as a city council person. Well, sure. I had the opportunity to meet with, with the core group, and um, I've heard the concerns, and, and I've talked to Paul Spector, and when he gets back from vacation, he and I are going to work on developing the district. Um, he knows more about it than I do. I haven't, I haven't been involved like he has for, for the number of years that he has. But um, when he returns, he and I are going to sit down and uh, he's going to get to work on that same thing. I'd love to hear from everybody. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm available if anybody wants to talk about it. I'd love to hear everybody's view on it. Uh, yes, I'm Beth Smolin. I have 84 residents in Rockford. I've been my question is, is there a time limit in which this needs to be done if the uh, developer has taken um, possession of the campus? Or is, is our effort, can we still have an influence? Well, you know, it's a little bit unknowable what the developer's timetable is, but I, I have a sense that, that there are a lot of uh, procedures that the developer has to go through as well as a lot of procedures we have to go through. So we've been um, trying to move our end of it along as quickly as we possibly can. And, and you know, at this point I'm not sure that we have a lot of ability to influence the timetable, but, um, it, you know, it's, there are, there are requirements we've had to fulfill, and uh, you know we, we're we're trying to move forward uh, in a in a very deliberate with all deliberate speed. I guess. <laughs> yeah, Jack. Um, we the, the developer. Um, has the land been purchased? Is there a contract in place yet? Well, that hasn't been made public. Um, there, there, a developer has been chosen. Uh, I don't know what the status of that uh, that transaction is right now. It, you know, at some point it will become public. It's not public now. Is there a plan in place, or is this just the developer? Unknown, the developer with no the particular. Developer. I do not know the identity of the developer. I do not know what the plans the developer may have are. And there were no restrictions. Um, we should ask. Know. We should ask our Clark trustee. Yes. Uh, um, eight out of a large pool of interested parties. Uh, I'm sure that many of you know that we have put out a request for proposal for the campus. And the deadline, which had been in July, was extended because there were some interested parties that wanted to do more due diligence. They wanted to look into the buildings and really explore uh, and understand the character of the neighborhood and talk to a few of you. And I, I know that a few of you, uh, when I say you, as in the neighbors, uh, maybe you, those that they spoke to are not here this evening, uh, but they did have some conversation with, with neighbors about uh, what they were interested in doing. And out of those several uh, proposals, the school has identified what we feel is, quite frankly, the best opportunity to preserve the character of the neighborhood. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say who the developer is because we have not signed an agreement. It, it wouldn't be fair to the developer for me to disclose that. But I would say it's important for Clark because we're going to continue to be there on Round Hill. Several trustees live in the area. We love, we love the neighborhood, and we would not have chosen this developer if we did not feel that it would be in character with the neighborhood. So I, I can't say to you the details, but you need to go through your process because that's your right as a neighbor and as a property owner, and and we welcome that. But there also is something to be said for a little bit of trust. And I know that without knowledge, it makes you uncertain, and that's uncomfortable. And that's reasonable. <coughs> but 
peers. For those of us that are going to be here for the long haul, uh, and I consider myself one of those, I feel very good about the plan that was presented to us. As a person that lives here in Northampton and was lived here for 16 years and plans to live here for until the, I'm given the the first there. question was on the back there. there on the car back. Uh, I'm not sure who yours? Yeah, uh, Jane Rainey, Langworthy Road. I don't know if we're talking about 11 acres or the entire campus right now. And I had heard that only 11 acres were being developed. And I'd also like to know if the three historic buildings are within that 11 acres. <coughs> Within the, you mean like in the heart of the campus, not visible from Correct. the street? Correct. Uh, my information is that it's 11 point something acres. It doesn't include Bell Hall and its immediate grounds, right? But the whole rest of the campus. So, um, I, as far as I know, uh, historic district uh, restrictions would not have any effect on buildings that are not on a public thoroughfare. So I, I mean, I suppose if a, you know, if a road were opened up into the heart of the campus that was a public way, that then uh, historic district uh, guidelines would then apply. But uh, it really only, you know, really only covers things that are are visible from from the street. So I mean, but. Uh, you know, we could certainly hope that uh, other historic buildings might be seen as valuable by the developer and, and in some way preserved or used. Who else was, uh, yes, you? Peter Jones, formerly of 23 Round Hill Road. <coughs> I'd be interested in knowing what some of the criteria Clark used to judge the proposal since one was chosen, there had to have been a comparative process. And I'd like to know some of the things that the school was looking for from developers. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely not in a position to speak to that. I don't know if you have anything you want to say on that um, subject. I, Can you stand up, please? Yeah, I'll, sure. Or, um, or. There were a number of criteria. Um, First and foremost was to preserve the character of the neighborhood because as a volunteer, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been losing my voice all day. Um, as a volunteer for Clark for many years, part of what drew me to Clark initially was that I wanted to see the buildings because I'm an architecture buff. And then when I saw the work was doing was going on there, that's why I decided to volunteer. So part of it was that we wanted to make sure that the character was preserved because our children will still be there will still be your neighbors. So we wanted to make sure of that. We also wanted to make sure that of the proposals that were presented to us, the maximum amount of green space was preserved. Um, this the, the deal that we are currently negotiating preserves much of the green space that we see at the beauty of the Clark campus. And it is a reuse to I, and I, I'm not a developer, so I would say what I looked at the plans, um, the majority of the buildings are reused. Um, I didn't see any details for teardown, not a single one. So generally speaking, when I look at a plan and I see for a development plan that there isn't a teardown, that there is a reuse of buildings with beauty, that's a wonderful thing for me. Economic viability is another. You know, any sort of speculative development in this economy is a challenge. And the developer with whom we've been negotiating um, has a track record of successful redevelopment of this site, of this sort. So there were other lesser important criteria, but I would say those were the primary criteria. Does that answer your question? Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Anything else anybody wants to ask at this point? Yes. Yeah, I, um, I live at, uh, my name is Bill Ames. I live at 26 Crescent. Yeah. <clears throat> I lived at 207 Crescent for 40 years. So I've lived in that neighborhood, and uh, I'm very concerned about it. Now, the thing is, I know change is coming. 
Park School is no longer, I guess I'd say no longer needed because we don't have as many deaf children. So there's going to be change. We've got, we've got to expect that. Things just don't stay the same. So uh, I don't know why uh, there'd be such a secret as to who's going to develop it. Uh, now, you say it, it's not fair of a person. If, you've made, if they've made a choice, it's no longer anything, as far as I can see, that would be something that needs to be protected. And the decision is made. They've got their company. What's, what's the problem? Now, um, we, I, I think it's important for us to know that so that we, we can check out his, his record for previous uh, work that he's done, places that he's preserved. That would make us more comfortable. And when you say, well, this is in the midst of an election, let's find out if uh, people running for office are in favor. I say in favor of what? We can't stop change. That, that, it's, there's going to be a change of some sort. Am I in favor of it? I don't like change. <laughs> I don't like it at all. So, um, I would say, uh, tell us who the, or we should find out. I, I'm surprised it can be kept a secret today. Nothing's a secret. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, long <laughs> <end of this. laughs> We're asking Ricky Leaks to help out. Uh, I, I hear everything you're saying. We're all very curious to know uh, what the plans are, and, and we will know that in time. But, but you know, it's it's unfortunately we can't simply demand to see them right now. So, yeah. Uh, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about how the core group determined uh, what the ex what the application what the new definition of the Elm Street <laughs> historic district would be, as, as I understand the boundaries, it. Yes, they would fall? exactly. Well, actually, the existing uh, Elm Street Historic Commission people were the ones who suggested those boundaries to us. Um, and as I understand it, they have uh, long been interested in, in pushing the boundaries of, of the district out at, at various points to include some more of Northampton's historic buildings. And the Round Hill neighborhood was a part of uh, an area that they had long been interested in bringing under their umbrella of protection. And uh, so it, it just you know happens to neatly circumscribe the, the Clark campus, but it also includes buildings that uh, don't belong to Clark. It includes uh, private residences. It includes some buildings that belong to Smith. Um, it even includes some very unhistoric structures. <laughs> but you know, because because uh, you know, not all the old things have, have remained, and some new new things have been put up, and they just happen to fall within the boundaries. Uh, let me just add to that, sir. Yeah. Um, Everybody has a map of this possible extension of Elm Street on, in your packet there. Um, and you might notice that uh, both sides of uh, Round Hill are included, but only one side of Bancroft Road is included, the inside side, the side that abuts Clark School. Also notice that um, neither side of Langworthy the houses there are not included. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes behind those houses. So those those decisions were thought through. Um, we had a couple or three meetings with, with Wayne here discussing staff capabilities mm -hmm. to sort of uh, oversee any extension. And uh, other issues came up. But uh, uh, you know, rather than summarizing everything we discussed, this, this is kind of how it worked out. Maybe Wayne wants to add something in. Well, I, just, you know, I have to leave a few minutes, so I, I'm more here as a resource. So if people have questions for an answer, I'm happy to have a Is there anything that anybody wants to ask Wayne while he's here with us? Yeah. Uh, what are the current restrictions on building in what's now the Clark School? Um, from a historic standpoint, there's none. So, um, Every place in the city that's not a historic district or downtown is covered what's called demolition delay. So if Clark or anyone else wanted to tear down a building 
within the, within Clark School now, you have to come before the Historical Commission. If the building was built prior to 1900, which most of those buildings are, or is a listed building from 1900 to 1939, they have to ask the, um, the Historic District, uh, the Historic Commission for the right to tear it down. The Historic Commission could say, yes, you can tear it down, or they could delay it by up to a year, but they couldn't prohibit it. So that's the current rules. Um, and then under zoning, um, zoning limits the, the, how the property can be reused, um, and frankly can potentially actually be one of the problems here is that it's hard to reuse some of those buildings. So again, I don't, I don't have any information on who the developer is, but some use of the buildings might not be allowed, Which? and so potentially it's worth looking at the zoning to think about. What would not be allowed? Um, well, it, it <coughs> talks a lot about the number of units, and, and so the reality is if you're taking a large dormitory, and again, I, I don't know anything about the developers, so I'm just sort of totally speculating, but you could imagine the way the market is for a large dormitory, it's unlikely to, to be divided into a bunch of 2,500 square foot units. It's more likely to be smaller units. And zoning isn't about the amount of units, the amount of building being developed, it's about the number of units. So there could be a disincentive there if you want to make it you know, smaller apartments, for example. Does that answer? Yeah, no, there's the, on, on I, I live at 52 Crescent Street on one side of the lawn of Budding. That extends down from what used to be the president's house. There's an apartment building on the other side um, that obviously falls within what's acceptable in zoning, and something like that would be an acceptable use. Do you know the building? I mean, yeah, it's at the, the, yeah. The issue is really how much land goes with each unit, because in a, this is a shortcut. It's not exactly right, but you need about six thousand square feet of land per, per dwelling. So you could take any building and do any amount of units you want with it, but that eats up the land. And so it depends on how they want to divide the land. When, um, when uh, our school gave this uh, project to Landvest to uh, receive the bids and uh, advertise the property, they, um, they put this design up that it would be possible to build 84 units up on Round Hill. Can you say anything about this design? Is, is this uh, possible under the current zone? You know, Frank, we never studied it in detail. I, I know that this design was done not by developer, it was done by Berkshire Design, who was really basically trying to tell developers, great property, you should get really excited about that the, the sky is the limit. So I don't know to what extent, I don't know the level of due diligence that they did this at. Yeah. You know, again, if you took 11 point whatever acres it is and divide by 6,000 square feet, that's the right ball. I think that's how I got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are, are people having, asking questions to Wayne now? Yes. Yeah. Um, are there any listed buildings on the Clark School property now that are historical buildings? There's nothing on the National Register of Historic right. Places. Um, there are many buildings which are National Register eligible. Um, for federal purposes, being in the National Register or National Re Register eligible are the same. Um, but there's no regulatory impact for that. You know, if you're trying to do a bank with regards to a federal permit, being the National Register matters. For anything else that's going on up there, National Register is mostly symbolic. When you can I add to that? There are a number of buildings that are preferably preserved. Uh, they're, they're, they're not on the federal register, but North Hampton has identified them as uh, what's called preferably preserved, houses of historical importance, importance to the city. What David's talking about is we have something called Form Bs, which are inventories of city buildings. And you can guess wandering up there, but all the buildings that look like they're historic are historic. <laughs> uh, if in fact, uh, I, I live on Bancroft. Um, if in fact, as the trustee said, there, there aren't going to be any teardowns, what would be the impact of turning this into an, a historic district? Well, it's two impacts. I mean, you know, Everybody wants certainty in the world. So yeah. you as neighbors all want certainty in terms of historic district having some more pre protection there. Developers get nervous about that kind of thing. So the same thing that makes sense for you scares off some developers. Um, and because developers worry, you know, again, I don't know if this developer, maybe it's deep pockets, but if you're going to the bank and borrowing money, the bank says, I want to know that you pre-sold 75%, make up the number, but it's the right ball, ballpark, the pre-sold 75% of the units before I lend you money. 
the more uncertainty there is, the longer the time period, the more it scares the bill. Sure. So that's really the, the, the side. I, I'm a great advocate for historic districts. They work really, really well in mature neighborhoods where you don't, not talk about major changes. They're more of a challenge when you know there's lots of changes going on. If, if I might uh, follow up. Um, so it, what impact would it have on zoning? Would there be any impact on zoning? It's totally separate. So you know, if somebody needs a permit under zoning and they need a permit to this historic district, a permit under historic district. So the same number of units would be allowed and, and all of that sort of thing. Right. Now separately, this covers Clark School but covers a lot of other properties. And this is only the brainstorming phases. Nothing's been introduced to city council, much less voted on. But we're looking at um, a lot of formerly institutional properties that are no longer going to have those institutional uses. Clark School, Smith College, uh, at the very least Florence Grammar School, portions of the VA hospital, um, and lots of Catholic churches. Um, so we've generally, we've generally been looking at these old institutional uses. What happens in Massachusetts is if your use was a commercial use or residential use, and the zoning changed around you, you have some grandfather rights. You can move from one use to another. If your use was an educational use or religious use, because this state grandfathers all that stuff, it allows all, all those uses, there's no grandfathering protection for changed uses. So all those institutional uses are actually a disadvantage. So we've been playing with different approaches for that, and one approach the planning board's at least been discussing, we have a series of public meetings is saying, if you're building, again, the numbers could change, but the building is 50 years old or older, and it was developed for education or, or religious uses, that you could reuse that building for something else. Um, and that might create more, it basically it's, if you think of rules as being part carrot, part stick, historic district is very effective, but it's definitely on the stick side. This potentially is on the carrot side to say, give more flexibility for an owner so they can actually make a return on the building. But, so, zoning and historic districts are independent, <coughs> and hopefully they work together. Um, you, um, I don't know that 65 Henshaw Avenue with is outside of this range of the historic district possible extension. And I know a lot of the discussion has sort of focused on that avenue yeah. of, of the discussion so far. However, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about part of the sale of this 11 plus acres is the athletic field, mm -hmm. which is along Henshaw Avenue. So it's a large open space. And I wanted to see if that zone the same as the rest of the campus for one and also has a great consideration by the city about how that site would be accessed. Because you know, I see only three possible ways to get in there. One is through the safety department's parking lot from Smith. One is to have a private property down the house allow access. And the third is to go down an extremely steep hill from Round Hill Road. So I just want to know what sort of possible uses are for that site yeah, yeah. and how you're going to get I don't really know the details. I, don't, I frankly know exactly what Clark has talked about selling, so I don't know how, how much that feels there. I believe it's zoned the same, although I don't have a zoning map in front of me, so I can't tell you that for sure. Um, the Historic District Commission, so the commission has been involved in discussions. I think there are two minds. Part of them, because as David said, whoever said, they've been very interested in expanding the historic district generally. So they'd, they'd love to have a much broader area of expansion. Um, they're worried, I think, about slowing down the process and a lot more conversations and worried about getting a lot more opposition to the process. So I know at some point they've looked at Bancroft, they've looked at Henshaw, they've looked at other areas as well. They're not proposing to do anything else at this point. Wait, I there's the max that you brought up earlier. Really right. So this is actually slightly different. This is also talking about expanding areas of Smith College, because Smith is also talking about you know surplusing some of this property. So one thing they talk about is over here, what is Kensington would probably have less interest to you. But also in discussions they've talked about going over here as well. Again, that's not the current drawing over here. You know, we heard from one Smith Co one um, Clark School trustee when we met with them saying, you know, many of you probably live in this district, but probably many of you live outside of the district. They sort of felt like, you know, should people who don't live in the district be having the right to lobby for regulations that don't pertain to them? Um, and so some interest in doing that area there, but again, I think as of the last meeting of the Historical District Commission, they're not really looking at that area. Um, 
but it could be some other time. Mm -hmm. yeah. As far as you know, potential access to the, the playing field area, I mean, when Jonas shows the plans that his group put together, you'll see what some people's thoughts on that subject were. Um, but we don't know anything about the actual plans. Oh, so person for sheer design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Um, with this development and the way the things you've just said, this will be spot zoned for URB. Will it also be zoned URA? It's URC right now. Well, if you ha say if you redid a classroom building into multifamily, that would have to be URB. And if you develop the URC is the less restricted zoning. Mm -hmm. So campus for the districts we have that are primarily residential, this is the least restricted zoning. But we want restrictive zoning. But right now, we it's <laughs> yeah, I would just like to make one comment. Um, you heard a lot tonight about Clark. You didn't count the number of times Clark has been mentioned, but clearly in the hundreds. Um, when you look at the map of the proposed extension, it goes the whole way down to Elm Street. And certainly our institutional neighbor to the south is interested in selling off at least three properties that would fall in that district. So I think we need to take this larger view of the historic district. Um, it you know, starts at the bottom of Elm Street, almost with a house that was built by um, Carl Putnam goes up to the, the top of the hill and to a house that was built by his father, Roswell Putnam. And um, there's more than Clark School in between. So uh, which three buildings are the Smith ones? That are the Gables. The Gables. Um, there's a, they, they own some apartments. I think Freeman House. Yeah. 17. Just yeah. behind the old truck. And then there is um, no the Hall, the old um, public safety building. Well, I think Tilly Hall is not the version. But, the right, it's not. But yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, if a high rise goes back there, we would all see it. <coughs> Actually, in this version, right. it's in the prison version they were talking about last week. Yeah. 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 So that's not actually the most recent one. They're just talking about Is that the only yeah. change for me? We have a You're basically cutting out. This area here, mm -hmm. so uh, Tilly and then that portion of the field, yeah. mm -hmm. looking at all these different. Right. Yeah. Not sure if this question is for Wayne or from Jesse or whom, but assuming that I, I, we don't know what the developer is going to do with it, so we're not sure. But if it's residential, and if it's multiple units, will this result in a significant increase? in tax in revenue income for the city. It would definitely result in significant increase in tax revenue. The question obviously is how many kids are there and do you make money or lose money? I mean, right now, in essence, it's tax free. So anything's a significant increase. It all depends on who's there and you make money or not. But yes, probably. And, and, and so you know the pattern city, I don't want to sound like I'm anti-kid, I have a child, I love kids. But <laughs> if you look at the, the pattern of settlement in Northampton, in basically all of the older residential neighborhoods and the denser neighborhoods in town, we basically make money on kids because the people have an average of about half a school age kid per housing unit. In a lot of the newer subdivisions where people have an average of about two school age kids per housing unit, we lose money. So as a, as a rough rule of thumb, yes, we would make money. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may comment on this question, there are two factors. Uh, one is the number of residences, two is the amount of taxes they pay. Uh, you could increase the number of residences and reduce the total tax uh, take if it reduces the value of property. Sure. I'm, I'm David Drake. I'm chairman of the Historical Commission. The Historical Commission is, is a city commission. Um, uh, what planning or conservation or something. And it's different from the Historic District Commission. Two different groups. But um, our, our ability is to impose or not impose demolition delays, as Wayne said. Those are for, that would be 
for building outside of any historic uh, district or outside of the downtown area. Um, my role here tonight is not to have, not to express an opinion, but simply to be a resource. I have served on historic district commissions, uh, however, and I'm pretty familiar with how they work and the kind of regulations they have. And they're an interesting creatures, like Wayne, and I'm very much in favor of them. They are the most powerful way to preserve a neighborhood uh, that, that has historic value to it. Creating one requires some very mature decisions on the part of the homeowners because you are imposing restrictions on yourself. And you have to be very clear in your mind that it's worthwhile to do that in order to have the protection of your neighbor also not being able to paint his or, his or her house orange if they want to, or uh, not being able to tear down all kinds of features that, that, are, that make that your neighbor's house beautiful uh, because they have a whim and want to you know, uh, do that. It preserves the entire neighborhood. And the Stark District Commission, the people who pass judgment on proposed changes, are responsible for being responsible, They're for not turning down reasonable requests. But um, the district commission, the Stark District Commission, basically is there to make sure that if, if, you, uh, if you have a house that looks historically valuable now, that it's preserved that way. And that nobody uses the garish colors, nobody, um, uh, you know, frankly, looking at this audience, I, I don't think we're talking about anybody wanting to put animal house in there in the, in, in, in the middle of the neighborhood, but, but you never know, and that's the thing. Uh, it, it, this historic district commission uh, for preservation really does help you uh, avoid those unforeseen and undesirable changes that would take away from the historic <coughs> value of a neighborhood. And um, it, it, you know, it does, there are people who say, you know, nobody can tell me what to do with my house. And if that's your attitude, then a historic, a historic district is kind of rough because they, they can tell you what to do with the outside of your house that faces the street. They actually can, uh, unless you, you know, want to pursue it in court. But it is for a purpose. And no reasonable change is going to be turned down. It doesn't mean you can't build anything. Um, theoretically, it doesn't mean you can't tear something down. But it does mean that if it's historically valuable, you may be turned down in your request. So, for example, if there was a historically valuable house, then the district, historic district commission could say, no, it's really not right to tear that down, period. Um, uh, but on the other hand, if you wanted to build a, a dormer, uh, and we're willing to do it so that it looked like it was in integrated into the rest of the house. No reason why they wouldn't give you that approval. Um, uh, as long as it's you know done properly and, and uh, you know everything's up, up you know up to snuff. So that's my my. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about how this historic districts work. Um, the, 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 the net takeaway to me is always that it preserves property values and probably increases property values because. It's, it's preserved that nobody's going to be, you know, making wacky changes. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a neighborhood decision. Could you, could you comment on the process of how it works? Because I heard from some commission members that they're very willing to negotiate with people. That this is not a cut and dried, well, you can't do this, you can't do this, but pe people talk it over. It's always a matter of discussion. Yeah, you get, a, you get, you get somebody who, uh, let's say everybody, I was on a historic district commission it's an area that had very colonial buildings over the eastern end of the state. And somebody would want to come in and put a, replace an old leaky drafty window with a modern window. So a classic discussion that you'd have with them is, well, you don't want to put in a plate glass window where there used to be, you know, a, a multi-pane window, but maybe there's something that's in between, something that has those, you know, those dividers and it makes it look like the original thing, but they can still get the advantage of the, of the modern window. And so you work it out. It's always a matter of discussion. Yeah. Can I say one other thing I'm going to slip out, just so you all know sort of the, the potential tools. I, I agree absolutely with what David said about historic district being the strongest tool that's out there from a regulatory standpoint, from the standpoint of what the city can do to impose. Like you read the same quote from Mass Historic. Um, there is another tool out there which we've used sometimes, which is basically do. So the historic district is great when you can't necessarily agree with somebody. When you want when two thirds of city council wants to impose the regulations, you can do this as in essence a development agreement 
which is even stronger, it's stronger tool, where everybody spells that. So we've done this, for example, for a place on King Street um, that was going to a, a, a cell phone store. Um, the neighbor was happy to have a cell phone store, but they wanted the building to be two stories and not have pornography in the building. Um, and so there's a development agreement for that. So you could do things in a development agreement which you couldn't do otherwise by regulation. So, for example, um, historic district regulations do not prevent landscaping. So if um, tomorrow, not that they're planning to do this, but tomorrow Clark School wants to take a chainsaw and cut down all those amazing specimen trees up there, they could do that. And if we passed a historic district ordinance, they could still do that. Um, so one thing that they could come up is a developer could say, hey, I want to negotiate. I want more certainty as to which buildings I'm going to alter, which buildings I'm going to tear down. In return, I'm willing to give you more certainty about which la what landscaping remains. So it's a tool. It's only a tool if everybody agrees to it. Frankly, I'm not trying to give you political advice, but frankly, the path you're going down is great because it puts pressure on creating a historic district is an effective way to get whoever this developer is to the table. Before there's actually a vote for city council, that may be the time to sit down and say, do we really want to go this path or is there a different route? So I think for now you still want to continue this path, but just know it's in there in the, in, in the bag of tricks. Thanks Thank very much. The risk of playing devil's advocate, perhaps, Mr. Drake, might be close this. I don't know. There was Lord a house. Please. Can, can you can you stand? <laughs> I can't hear you. At the risk of playing devil's advocate, perhaps, um, there was a house on Sherry Street um, next to the jail that recently won an award for historic preservation, and I'm not sure which 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 order that should have been under, which level of protection that should have been under. Are you familiar with it? But the, the, part, the award don't, don't, don't right, protect the Right, in terms of antiquity, but in terms of his historic um, relevance and or antiquity, are you sure, are you, do you know what level of um, protection that might have received normally? Right, right next to the, it's a yeah. house right next to the jail. Yeah. That building had no protection. The award says it's really important. In terms of demolition delay, Mr. Drake, do you, are you familiar with that? What level of protection that would have received? It was a parcel demolition. Toward yeah. the building, using it as a parcel demolition. Yeah, there was, the sequence of things happened there. I don't. I, I can't it didn't it. actually get the attention of any demolition delay. Um, there's a small portion of it. There's a very large single-family structure that went very large. Looks like it might be a multi-family that went up in its place. There was no um, um, demolition delay request. Nothing was attended to. There's a very small portion of it. Apparently, it was preserved. Some bit of flooring. But the house was demolished, and a very extraordinarily large structure went up in its place. It received no attention, no review, no nothing. It's, it's, it, there's, so there's power in numbers in, in, in building a group. And certainly an anomaly based on how, how these orders are, are supposed to be set up and observed, but it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, just be clear, demolition delay mm -hmm. is basically ineffectual against the institution. Because if, if you all decide to put your house in the market, and you have one buyer who says, I'll give you half a million dollars to close tomorrow so I can save it as a house. And one buyer who says, I want to tear it down, I'm going to have to wait a year before I can tear it down, so I'm going to give you less money. You're probably going to sell the buyer that's going to preserve the building. So it's really effective for single family homes. But, but whoever they, reuses the campus is going to have a long planning horizon, and waiting a year is nothing. So demolition delay doesn't, doesn't preserve buildings on, on a campus like this. Smith College, for example, who plans ahead. They go for a demolition delay permit. They're doing one now. I don't care what you guys say. They're not planning to tear down for a year anyway. Yeah. So demolition delay is not going to protect. A year from the now. date of the request. That's right. Just, just to by background, the uh, historical commission is aware of the problem you're talking about, okay. and we are working to bring a proposal to the to the council concerning partial demolition that would include partial demolition as well. But it's, in, it's in the working process. But partial demolition might be considered a misnomer if you could see if you could see the property in the building. I'm well aware of what you're talking about. <laughs> Trust me. And that order was just recently put, um, put into place because of demolition. Um, Wayne, I'm sorry. I can say for Mine's actually not for Wayne. Okay. Mine's for a trustee. Mine question. is for Wayne, actually, just really quick. <laughs> uh, obviously, one of the main concerns about the neighborhood right now is uh, not is the building on the field that uh, the 
the Clark is part of the Clarksville property, and also all of that, uh, all of those apartments uh, that that are part of Smith right now. Um, and, 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 and that's not really a matter of preserving historic structures because those apartments behind Helen Hills Chapel are frankly not very attractive and we don't want them to be covered by any historic standard whatsoever. <laughs> um, so my question is, other than creating a historic district, what are the other uh, possibilities for the neighborhood to help make sure that any, any construction there is you know, appropriate? I mean, uh, would, would a historic commission be able to review any construction? Uh, Which is an historic history. Yeah. They do. Yeah, the standards are more limited. I mean, it's, it's, it's compatibility. You know, is, it, is what you're doing compatible with what was there before? But yeah, historic district certainly looks at all those things. What other things should should this committee consider? There's uh, a lot to, of stuff uh, in here that you okay. can read on that subject. Well, did, Wayne, did you, was there anything else besides big, making a historic district that you think? In, in the short term, no. I think generally the city is moving and it has been doing this for 10 years moving towards less regulations on use and more regulations about um, how buildings fit with the neighborhood and, and how they, they work together. Because that's more the issues we hear. People say, hey, a two-family, if, it, if it's totally invisible to me, I don't care about it. It's when it's not visible I care about it. So that's a long-term trend that's out there. And then Jane's comment, I think it's true, the city could down some. I, don't, I think it's less likely to happen, this an area where all the plans have said this is the appropriate zoning, but it would be a legal tool for city council. I assume that this project would have to come up uh, for site plan review through the city. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I'll be talking about. Next. Jonas I, I think we have to move yeah. on. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that we probably ought to okay. bid you okay. farewell and okay. uh, thank you very thank much you. for your time. Good and, 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 I, and I ought to allow Jonas to take over, but yeah. I just have one question. Sure. Uh, it's for the trustee. Uh, traffic is a big thing throughout the city, and it is going to change your character, your neighborhood. In your request uh, to the developers, is a traffic study is that in part of it? Because it is going to change the character of the neighborhood. It it was not a requirement of the RFP. I imagine that part of the site plan review it would be requested. Okay. Uh, and all of the uh, proposed uh, developers had mentioned that as part of their timeline uh, for development. I just, I, I just want to make sure that's because that will change the character of your neighborhood. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a moment in the process where the city reviews parking and, and traffic concerns, so it's, yeah. there's there's public input in that, that issue. I think I should turn the floor over to Jonas and, uh, and, and looking at sample site plans, because I, I think your find is very interesting and, and, and educational. So. Oh, thanks, sir. I wanted to be out of here by 8.30, so I'm going to try to be brief um, and maybe go a little bit over. Um, whether or not Round Hill becomes part of the historic Elm Street Historic District, there will be a site plan process that the developer will have to go through and present the new site plan to the planning board. The uh, planning board has power to change that site plan, to ask for changes and so on. Uh, in accordance with the ordinances that exist. So there's the background of the ordinances, and then there's the planning board, which is sort of the enforcer. And uh, citizens are welcome to those meetings. So I uh, wanted to, everybody to know to kind of look ahead to that beyond the process of the historic dis district is when there are meetings right here in this room uh, that you can come and walk up to the podium and say you like the site plan for this reason or that reason or you don't like this or that. Um, and it will be extremely very critically important for you to get a copy of the site plan before uh, it's presented to the planning board. But what we in the core group would like to do is to make sure that everybody gets a copy of that site plan when it when it's ready and that we have a meeting amongst uh, interested folks, interested citizens to look over and make comments on the site plan so that when we come to the meeting we're prepared. We're educated and prepared, and I, I'm speaking from experience because we had development happen near us once, and um, I was not prepared. I was kind of overwhelmed. I, we had a site plan that looked from above and not from the sides, and uh, certain things happened that really uh, harmed us and reduced our values of our, of our property. I wasn't prepared, so we're hoping to prepare you if, if you want to be part of, part of that educational process. Now, one thing, uh, one little educational piece that I, I developed is, um, as a neighbor, I, I got extremely interested in this. Uh, we, we have a 
we abut uh, the Skinner parking lot in the back of Clark School. And so, uh, and we've got a couple old elms there that's got, that have to be um, maybe 100 years old, um, 60 feet high. And I'm looking at those trees and going, I hope they stay. But do I have any power over that? Probably not. Well, maybe I do. Anyway, about a year ago, I started calling uh, local people um, who are professionals. I called Jonathan Wright. I called who's a local builder um, that very highly respected. I called Harry Dotson in Ashfield, who's a landscape architect. I called Joel Russell, who's a local zoning lawyer, um, very well respected, has worked on King Street stuff, and um, a historic renovation architect from Boston. And uh, we had eight people that I finally got together in one meeting after I had given them tours of Clark School. So I, I was on six or eight tours of all the buildings. And I got to know the campus really well. And I didn't necessarily want to do this, but I just kept looking at those trees and that space and what can I do. So I, um, we had several meetings with this team and then we fought, so an investor stepped up. Um, and so we made a proposal. We responded to the RFP and we tried to keep neighborhood concerns in mind. We looked at the neighborhood from every angle, including ours, selfishly. Um, and also a couple other neighbors in particular were very interested in how, how to protect their, their backyards and so on. Well, um, in the end, our proposal was not accepted, and I understand why. I, I have no bad feelings about that whatsoever. Um, I'm sure that you made a good choice, uh, and I don't know who the chosen developer is either. Um, but um, I spent a year on this, and I have all this documentation <laughs> that I would like somebody to use. So that's what I'm selfishly going to share something with you, which is a site plan that Harry Dodson did. And I'm, I'm showing this to you to think about this. Think about, these are the kinds of things that you think about when you're doing a site plan. And uh, so here's option one. Now this site plan, let's see if, we can, if everybody can see. We might need both lights off. Yeah. Okay. Do you need that other one off? Can we move the podium? Try it off. Can we move the podium so we can see? Because we can't see. You know, I can probably make it bigger okay, by moving you. it too. Is that okay? Or right. you can move Thank forward. You very much. Okay, so yeah. a couple things we discovered in our team, and I, I'm really glad to hear from the trustee that it's possible that there would be no demolitions because what what our team member, an engineer, and, and the um, construction guy uh, did, did not, be, uh, we felt that demolishing buildings would actually be more expensive and building new construction. So that, uh, so we came to the same kind of conclusion that the big building should stay. But our team also felt that even renovating all the buildings and the, old, the existing buildings and putting in apartments and condominiums, uh, our team felt that you couldn't make enough profit for either Clark or the developer if you didn't do any new construction. We felt there would have to be new construction. So this plan is irrelevant. It's only here as an educational tool. Um, although I would add this, if, and maybe the trustee can correct me if I'm wrong, but Clark School might negotiate a, um, the, the deal and, and sign on the dotted line and sell it to the developer, and then the developer, now that they own the property, could decide to do new construction. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be true? You, once you sell it, you no longer have control. Would that, would that be true? Correct. Uh, yeah, that, that is a true legal statement. Yeah. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on the particulars yeah. of the deal. Right, okay. Um, I mean, maybe you could. Maybe they could write it into the deed that there could never be new construction. I don't know. But let's say there is a new owner and they can come up with this idea. So um, here's Brown Hill Road. So we felt one possibility would be to keep gay with and to um, we had people come in from say Lathrop community to have a retirement community so there wouldn't be as much uh, traffic maybe with families and we would have uh, the, when Wayne was talking about the children that would not be a factor but there would be three new houses on on Round Hill Road and the gym and the pool would disappear that's the only, this, this is one plan where we decided let's try it without the gym and pool. Even though it would cost $500,000 to tear it down. We felt, okay, if you put three houses there, and then you put some here, and you put the parking right in the middle, 
and you plant lots of trees so that all the neighbors have greenway, this would all stay green down along Bancroft Road. So we have some residents here tonight along Bancroft. This, this would be a permanent green area that would be needed to stay green. Further down on Bancroft, there would be three houses. You know that area now, it's park-like, there's nothing there. It's very steep. It's too steep to build off in here, so the people on Crescent um, would, would have these new houses, but there would be greenways planned there. Um, but there would be nothing in here, because it's too steep anyway. Uh, the boiler house is here. There would be some parking that would be constructed here. There's some old buildings here that would be torn down, and these would be a few residences. The rest of it would be compacted toward the middle, so the people around the outside would still be looking at green. And the traffic flow would have to change. And there would be parking in the middle. And this would be a new road around here, around the middle, and uh, coming out here. And this this would be uh, this is Jane's house. Uh, Jane and Nick, uh, ja I'm sorry, Janet and Nick's house over here, um, with the driveway that we reconfigured to, to make it better for Janet's uh, family. So these are the kinds of things we had we thought about. Here's Adams and Coolidge buildings today. And there's a big common area in the middle here. But these would be houses. Now, this is a, a what I'm describing to you is like the economic considerations of the people on the team who have done a lot of construction. There would have to be new construction. Again, I'm I'm happy that maybe there won't be new construction. That would be cool. Um, but we felt that this is the only way to make some money because reusing the big, big buildings would cost so much to renovate them. They're, 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 not, they're not green certified buildings. There's a lot of concrete that's in contact with the outside weather on some of these old buildings that um, our team felt would have to uh, do some major green retrofit and be very expensive. So that's why some new construction would have to happen. So if, if there's no new construction, this is totally irrelevant. <laughs> if the developer comes to a place where he decides, like we thought, that he can't make any money just renovating the, old, the existing buildings, there will have to be new construction. And if, unless it's written into the deed, you know, when you sell it, that there can never be new construction. I'm just saying be prepared. Clark can have the best intentions they want. But once it's gone, it's gone, and the developer can do whatever he wants. Then you have to start thinking about this kind of thing. Where will the traffic go? How will the fire trucks get in and out? How's the water going to flow? There's a lot of underground water on this hill. People know about this. It, well, you know, we've had our basement flooded, and I know several of you have had basements flooded. I got a call yesterday from somebody down in Crescent who's uh, basement floods all the time. That's why the people came here for a water cure. So, um, so we tried to think all these things through. Uh, the trees can we keep? Which trees can we keep? Which ones are going to have to go? Uh, some neighbors would be upset about certain trees going. Uh, others would be happy that some would, were staying. We, we tried to get like save the most possible trees. And so this is how a developer would think it through. And where is an investor going to get some money back at least four percent or five percent in this market? That's okay. You know they like fifteen percent, but that's not happening anymore. Um, and then we have Round Hill to consider. Even if there's no new construction and you only put apartments and condominiums in Rogers and Coolidge and Gaywith and Hubbard um, and Adams, I'm sorry, Rogers is over here. Uh, you'll still you might still have a lot more traffic. And you'll have some parking issues. So there'll have to be some new parking uh, situations worked out. And where will that be? Those, that will definitely come up at the site planning meetings when it happens in the winter, in the spring. And that's what we have to be prepared for. Round Hill Road, you know, sometimes it's a single lane. So how much traffic can it bear for doing anything like this? Um, traffic is going to increase on Bancroft. And here's our house here. And traffic is also going to increase on Crescent, probably, back here. Um, it's not possible to put any new inroads in uh, from Crescent. Um, I don't have across the street, uh, I'm sorry, um, down off Henshaw. We had some new housing going in Henshaw. And, the, and because, you know, it, it's, uh, 
sorry to use this phrase, it's crass, but a profit center. <laughs> that soccer field is really attractive. It's one of the few places where you can build a bunch of houses. We thought about a pocket village that would be up the hill further from Henshaw, so Henshaw people would only see green. Um, but it would still be a downside for Henshaw folks. I realize that the, um, our planners put the, the driveway off Henshaw through uh, what is not, what used to be the Smith College um, Tilly Hall. It used to be Smith College Police Station, which is now for sale or will be. It's not for sale yet. Yeah. But, I mean, if we go further down Round Hill, three houses above Helen Hills Hills Chapel are going to be sold. And then back here, the old police station. <coughs> and down here, Henshaw. So a driveway coming up into that into a pocket village down there. As far as we know, um, the trustee is correct. There will be maybe no building down in Henshaw, which would be great. If they can do it and make a profit, that's, you know, cool. More power to them. Okay, I'll just take some questions. I'm just that's very quick overview of how a site plan, how it works. Yeah. What did you think to do with the boiler house? Um, we had a possible buyer for the boiler house that wanted to make a, an office building out of it. And um, our idea was to have this be a five to seven year plan and um, gradually get buyers for the different houses so that it would all work. You know, that it needs a master plan. And um, that that didn't fly, but that was our idea. That was one of the points that I wanted to address when you originally presented the five to seven year plan. The people who spent their life savings on buying these houses of very expensive things that were caught property, they're committed to staying there and there's going to be construction for seven years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the problems I have now. We don't know if they're We don't know if they're going to have to consideration. If they have plans to develop over the next 10 years. The grocers live right in the middle of the campus. Can you imagine living in their house for 10 years of construction one around you? Uh, but let me, let, me, let me add something. I totally agree with that. I don't, uh, I've had two, three major construction projects right next to our house, and I'm trying to record music, and it's horrible. Right. I, but there's, as the man said over here, change is inevitable. This is going to well, happen. Yeah, but but if you have a five to seven year plan, um, it's all not going to happen in one place for seven years. <coughs> Something's going to happen for a year, then someplace else for another year, etc. You, et you, you can hear it. That, that whole area on the top of the hill is like an amphitheater. Yeah. We can hear all the construction that's going on in the president's yeah. house, mm -hmm. yeah. which is quite removed and it's indoors. I know, sound travels horribly. There's no way, I don't know, if there's a solution to that. Yes? You had a question, Dr. Yeah. Um, I kind of wanted to bring this up when Wayne was here, um, but since you mentioned Henshaw and some Smith properties down in the area, I, I, I don't mean to um, harp on any issue, but keep in mind that Smith also has an overlay district. So in the areas where they can build, they don't have restrictions. So if you're going to have development with Clark School, and then if there's um, any change of development with Smith, then where they're essentially without restrictions, there's there's two layers or levels of possibilities there. So yeah. that's to keep, be kept in mind, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think, by the way, Smith has taken no position on the. Round Hill, the ex extension of the historic district. Yeah. They're, they're trying to remain neutral. They're not voting for or against it. But you're aware of the overlay which supersedes in a city yeah. Okay. yeah. Just want to make one comment if I may. The Magna House owns one third of what appears to be the athletic field. Well, yeah. It's not as big as it looks. Oh, interesting. That's right. yeah. yeah, that's true. And nothing could be built on that one third that's on the Magna right. House side. Yes. Um, well, just a, just a clarification for the trustee. Did you say you said there were going to be no teardowns, but you didn't say there's no, there's right. going to be no construction, right? Um, that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, make sure that I get it this correctly. Um, I don't have the plate in front of me. Uh -huh. I'm going from memory, but my recollection is that the buildings uh, that part of what attracted them to the campus was to with the ability to reuse the buildings. Um, I don't know that long term, uh, but they expressed considerable reservations over new construction in this economic climate. But they did not see, uh, that they looked at the inventory 
uh, in, in the general area for like neighborhoods uh, with uh, properties not moving, and they didn't think that it was economically feasible. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. The, the problem with that, as Joe just pointed out, is that that's not a permanent commitment. Oh, sure. Yeah, unless it's written into the deed that nobody can prevent them from doing new construction. It's, it's difficult, this is a difficult situation for Clark and the developer. I just want to acknowledge that because right, it's such a down market and investors are drawing back from investing in real estate. And also we have Hospital Hill and other places that are unused, you know, and they're not being rented and they're not being leased and so on and so forth. So to come in and start a whole new situation, it, it, it's risky. You know, so I just acknowledge a difficult situation. Yeah. Um, why were you denied? Denied. Um, why, why, why didn't they accept your proposal? Um, I, you know, they can speak to that, but um, I, I'm pretty sure I know why, and that is that we could not justify a big upfront payment, you know, like five or eight million dollars. We, we just didn't feel like we could, in this market and with uh, where we felt the profit could come from, we didn't feel like we could offer a big uh, upfront amount. That's just my own feeling. Oh, yeah. Let me ask a question. Yeah. Um, I have a question then, a comment. Um, if you would, for the group, would you tell us the total number of units that your proposal had, uh, had entailed? So well, I think it's hard to conceive when you're looking at the buildings versus yes. the number of units, because yeah. clearly going from a daytime educational institution with a very small number of people there overnight yeah. versus neighbors coming you know, through the up and down the street, that's a very right. different. So yeah. how many units in total did your proposal include? Uh, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, at one point it was 34, another point it was 44, and that, but we never were able to count how many apartments or condominiums or light office would go into Rogers and some of the other buildings. I don't think we ever counted those. I believe it was higher, but I'll, I'll defer you. You've got your own yeah. in front of you. But I do want to say to you, to one, um, there are a couple things that I've taken away from this evening. And first is that I was glad to hear that my household is a profit center for the city. So that was always nice. Um, we only have a dog. We don't have a child. So I guess that's good. Um, but I'm a good neighbor. And we pick up that. Um, really, I, I, I appreciate your position in wanting to know what's going on in your neighborhood. Because if it were next to me, I would feel the same. I live in the South Street neighborhood, and change is a challenge. I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand. And I, I can only express to you that all of the Clark trustees know that they need to do what is best for Clark and for the neighborhood. That we, are, we have been there, and we will continue to be there. So I would ask, please just trust I know that the details will give you comfort, but I think that you'll be happy once you see them, um, except for the gentleman who doesn't like change at all. Uh, but I think you'll appreciate the, the consideration that's been given to the character of the neighborhood. Well, I do want to comment on that. Selling Griggs told us that the main concern was maximizing Clark's profit. Uh, that wasn't too reassuring. No. Yes. That was that was one consideration, and uh, Sally Green, by the way, is the chairman she, of the board. She's not the chair, but she's a long time mm -hmm. member. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. very valued, and, and clearly one of the neighbors too. Mm -hmm. um, I I would say, without going to the particulars of yours, I, I would say one of the challenges that it presented is that it would have Clark being a developer who would be in partnership, mm -hmm. and um, the, the trustees felt very strongly that we needed to focus on what we do best and that is educating children, and that it wouldn't be good for the short term or the long term of the school uh, to be in the business of, of developing real estate. And so we wanted to put it entirely onto a developer who had consideration for it. So. Yeah, I, thank you. That, I, I agree with that. Um, because we, the master planning process that we had in mind would have been a partnership right. over time. Yes, yeah, true. Yes. yes. Um, with your plot plan up there, Three houses on Crescent, or to back up to Crescent, there's a very high water table there, higher than She's most girl. of the area. Right here? Yeah. 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 And has anybody done any kind of a water study? I called the state geologist six years ago. There's nothing on the books. 
And if you're going to develop, I'm going to demand curtain walls. Uh -huh. Do you all know what curtain walls are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's terrifying uh -huh. to think that they'll put basements in and realign all those underground springs. Mm -hmm. And nobody so knows where they are. Of course, if there's no new construction, that's not a problem. Well, it's yeah. a problem. But yeah. putting but in more parking lots yeah. and creating more asphalt yeah. infrastructure for all of us is a major problem. If there could be more asphalt, that's true, and it could, the water could get worse. It, we have not, we've talked about this in our, in our group, it, uh, how to get more information about the water situation. And uh, yeah, maybe we need to hire somebody. I don't know. We've talked about that, too. Uh, Jonas, I want to make another comment. Yeah. People are leaving. Uh, this is going to be a political process at two stages, one in the Star District, two the site plan. So talk to your friends and neighbors uh, about turning up for those uh, critical meetings. The numbers of people are going to be important and influential. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think I just got here with Hudson and I have a lot of concerns about what happens if this begins and everybody runs out of money. Right. I think that for us, that's the primary problem. We love Clark. We went through a great process with Clark. We don't think that Clark is going is going to have to go through the same sticky process we went through to buy a building from them. So we feel like the city should really be demanding from Clark the same thing that Clark and the city demanded from people who purchased buildings from Clark itself. It's only fair. And also, and also, I think that um, really. In this market, if this sells to someone, once it's out of Clark's hands and it's not an educational institution and it doesn't have the kinds of, you know, the kinds of um, really great things about Clark that have made Clark a wonderful partner for the city, you know, if we end up with a bunch of empty buildings up there, that's going to be terrible for us. So I think we really need to see exactly what kind of money is in this and, and, and I think the city itself would be facing a major problem if this failed. Yeah. So I think that that's something that we, that's we are more than what's going to change what would happen if it doesn't roll. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And, you know, we should also keep in mind that, and this is something that Bill Corwin has said um, to us, is that they're not in favor of the historic district for this reason that it could make it more difficult for the developer to do enough to make some profit. It could, because it, it, it adds another level of um, review by neighbors and more committees and more time possibly. So it could make it more difficult for a developer to actually be successful. Right. We have to, you know, that's part of the deal. Is that. Well, I think it's time to stop. We, we had, a, I think, a good overview of the situation. So uh, both the uh, Elm Street Historic District extension, that's one issue, and then slightly separate from that is the site review that's going to be coming up. And so. You're, on, you're all on the email list, and we'll just keep giving you some updates. And if any significant city meetings happen, um, we'll let you know about those. Also. Thank you.